if you de- if you define yourself as prophet, priest, and king, now I was really heartened to hear Colin do that. That, that was my opening point: prophet, priest, and king. But the thing is this: in Britain, that's unusual. Uh, if I asked most of you, "What's your job?" you'd have said, "Oh, I'm a pastor teacher." You wouldn't have said, "I'm a prophet, priest, and king." And if you did, the notes would have been, "I'm a prophet," then I'm a priest, and I'm a king. Because the king thing. We feel, oh, hold on a minute. Who wants to come and say, I'm a king? You know, see? It, it, we, we, that's where the narrative is the narrative of suspicion. Anybody that says, oh, I've got kingly leadership skills, you go, whoa, 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 hold on a minute. And uh, so that, it's, an, it's the neglected zone. Even if you did say, I'm prophet, priest, and king, the, the king thing is the neglected zone. We need to change that because uh, the Bible shows us that actually... If we're to lead churches, if we're to serve our churches well, we need all three zones working well. I love Colin's colour-coded, and I wonder if you did a colour code of how much time and energy and input and thought you put into each area of prophet, priest, and king. You would find king would be in the minor key all the time. So this morning, we're just going to spend a few minutes looking at some kingly leadership skills, okay? And we're going to look at three things, uh, just... Get your head working. I want you to think about creating and keeping a both and tension in church life. What do I mean by both and tension? If you've got your Bibles open, please do turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is the seminal passage that describes what church should be. You can find nine marks of a church in Acts chapter 2. Maybe they're not the same nine marks of the nine marks movement, but there they are. You can see the gospel and you see belief, and you see baptism, and then you see life. They devoted themselves. You see leadership, apostles. You see teaching. You see the koinonia, the fellowship. You see the breaking of bread, food, probably including the Lord's Supper, and you see prayer. Great nine marks of a gospel church, a healthy church. And at the heart of it is what we call organic Christianity, that personal commitment I commit myself to serving the Lord Jesus. I'm going to serve him by serving my brothers and sisters. They devoted themselves. It's from an experience of God's grace. I respond in love and service to my fellow believers and to the wider world. That's coming from within. Now, that's absolutely essential. Without that, you can't, you can't have Christianity. It needs to be organic. Now, many Christians leave it there. You, there are great authors who describe we need Acts 2 churches. Uh, Mega pastor Bill Hybels talked about Acts 2 church. Micro church pastor Tim Chester will talk about an Acts 2 church. And they're absolutely on the button. We want our churches to be like that, the same pattern as Acts 2. Here's the thing. If you have a whole load of sincere, devoted, committed, active Christians, what happens next? Well, it can descend into chaos. Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6 is that organic church becomes messy. Well-meaning, devoted Christians, it's not enough to have that. Acts 6 shows us this church was growing when those days when the number of disciples was increasing, they were groaning, they were moaning, they were... The whole thing wasn't, was creaking. And they brought in some organization. So you have the organic of Acts 2. But if you just stay there, you will not have all that a growing church needs. It needs some organization. Now, Acts chapter 6 is a massively neglected passage. It's misunderstood all the time. It's often, yeah, we've got deacons, tick box, move on. Acts 6 is one of the three great pressure points growing churches face. Number one, Acts 4, external opposition. Number two, Acts 5, internal moral corruption. We see both of those coming, but we don't see Acts 6, the complexity that needs good, kingly leadership. Acts 4 is met by prophetic commitment to God and his word. Acts Five is met by priestly holiness, but Acts 6 is met by kingly leadership skills. 
Its primary purpose is not to say, you pastor teachers, get on with preaching the word and don't get distracted by anything else. That's not what it's saying at all. What it's saying is there will be some problems in church life that can only over, be overcome by great kingly leadership skills in order for the word of God to go on being preached. But you could have preached your heart out against widows being hungry, but they'd still be hungry. You could have prayed like mad for manna from heaven to come down every day. But the church would have still been a chaotic mess. It needed great kingly leadership skills. So Acts brings us this tension between organic and organized. And as a church leader, you say, where is my emphasis? What am I putting all my... Am I overemphasizing one to the cost of another? Now, typically... We put our emphasis on personal godliness rather than organizational wisdom. And that's fine, but it can be a neglect. Let's look at another passage, 1 Timothy 5. This is a, this is a brilliant passage where you see the Apostle Paul sort of, sort of deftly touching on these two things all the time. 1 Timothy 5 starts, give proper recognition to those widows in need. If a widow has someone in their family, that person, that individual, organically should look after their widows. If someone doesn't look after widows in their family, they're worse than an unbeliever and so on. It's, it's all organic, personal responsibility and accountability. But then he moves on to the list of widows. Verse 9, no widow may be put on the list of widows. Now, we could, get a, we could easily get a seminar out of those few words, list of widows. If you can't get your head around that and think, well, how could you get a seminar out of list of widows? you obviously need to do some more work on kingly leadership skills because in that little phrase, list of widows, there is a ton of stuff. Why a list of widows? Well, it's a big church. There are some people who so love organic church, they don't want any of this organized stuff. But you don't need a list of widows in a church of 500. We have about 10. I could tell you all their names easily. I don't need a list. You need a list of widows when the church is growing and it's getting big and it needs some organizational wisdom. And here Paul says, look, there there will be a whole load of widows get looked after organically, but some widows will fall through the net. So you need a list of widows. He then talks organization. Then immediately talks on organization. He goes back onto the organic. Uh, Verse 11, he talks about younger widows. And then verse 16, if any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, goes back to the organic. And then in verse 17, he goes back to the organized. He talks about elders being paid. We all like this passage. (laughs) But it gives some criteria. How does the organization pay its workers? How does it make a choice when financial resources are limited? See what he's doing. He, He touches on organic. And the moment he puts his foot down there, he moves back to the organized. And the moment he touches on the organic, he moves back to the organic. All the time, he's keeping the tension between these two things. A a kingly leader will be constantly monitoring, how is the organic? Are people's souls warm towards Jesus? Are their hearts on fire for him? Are they devoting themselves? But the moment you touch on that, you then say, now, are we organizing them well? Have we got procedures in place to help this thing work as it grows? That's the first thing we need to think about, keeping the tension between The both and, not the I. Now, there's loads of both and tensions. Both word and deed. You see that in Acts 6, not either or. Both and. Uh, Both building up and reaching out. Both corporate and individual. There are loads and loads. But so much of the Christian literature is either or. Either or. Where we need both and. There's, There's a great book, and it is a really great book, called... Trellis and Vine. It's a great book. But it sets up an either or. Either you do trellis work or you do vine work. And what happens a little bit is that trellis work is a necessary evil. But it's really, I mean, if you ask, you like, are you with Jesus and the vine? Or are you with those kingly leadership stuff who all want to do trellis? Well, it's a no-brainer, isn't it? But if you set it up like that, you've already given the answer. And trellis work, kingly wisdom on organizing well tends to get seen as a thought, oh, that, hold on a minute, you know, that's really not what we really should be about. It sets up a false either or between organic and organized. If you use a different metaphor like skeleton and blood supply, which one of those do you want? You go, I think I'd like both of those, please. You see? 
So you've just got to watch those metaphors because they slip in without us really being aware and they, they steer us towards a preferred outcome where we either land mainly on organisation, but for most of us evangelicals, we tend to land mainly on the organic. But we need to keep that tension. Okay, second thing, we need to face up to size and season. We need to face up to size and season. What do I mean? Well, here's a quote from Tim Keller. One of the most common reasons for pastoral leadership mistakes is blindness to the significance of church size. Size has an enormous impact on how a church functions. There is a size culture that profoundly affects how decisions are made, how relationships flow, how effectiveness is evaluated, what its ministers, staff, and lay leaders do. We tend to think of the chief differences between churches mainly in denominational theological terms, but that underestimates the impact of size on how a church operates. I didn't know what the phrase size dynamics meant till I was nearly 50. Like, nobody told me. I said, what is all this stuff? Come on, it's just weird. But actually, if you look at your church, the size it is will affect the way it works and what kingly leadership skills you need to bring to bear on it. Now, here's the thing. In the literature, there are lots of people who advocate size of the size they love. So, let me again, Bill Hybels will talk about in the past mega church, how marvellous it all was. And they'll sing the praises of the size they love and tend to point out the flaws of the sizes they don't really think is great. And that can be the other way around. There will be writers who, who extol, Francis Chan, for example, is all, all of a sudden gone micro-church. And he's saying, oh, you know, the mega-church, terrible, micro-church is marvellous. But here's the thing. Every church size has as its pluses and its minuses. Every church size does. And you need to know what they are because they change over time. Here's a little exercise you might want to do as a leadership team. We, uh, we've done this at home several times where we've talked about small, medium, awkward and large. And we've talked about pluses and minuses. And we look at this uh, issue of small, medium, awkward, large and just say, okay, let's talk about what are the strengths of the size of the church we are right now? And we've, got, we've done this as a whole congregation. We've done this as a leadership team. And there's lots and lots of positives about any size. Maybe awkward hasn't got as many positives. But every size has its positives and every size has its negatives. Now, here's the thing. What you'll find is this. Most people look back with nostalgia on the size they were. We were once intimate, relational, warm when we were only 30. Or we were once 3,000 and now we're only 300, but it was amazing when Pastor so-and-so was on. You know, we look back to the size we were with nostalgia. We look forward to the size we may become with trepidation. Well, we don't really want to grow that big. Or we, won't, we don't want to die in the next decade. We look back with nostalgia, we look forward with trepidation, but the size we are now, we tend on the size we are now, this is what we feel. We feel the negative, mainly. It's because we're British. <laughs> and we're pessimistic. But, but people feel the size they are now. And we need to help them as leaders think like, okay, as we change, either grow or decline, what's going to change? So as you decline, there's not enough workers. That will be one of the big problems. Or as you grow, you'll grow a fringe and you don't know how to get them engaged. Core is hot, fringe is large. How do we change that? There's lots and lots of things. Now, as a church talks this through, not just you as a leader, but as a church talks it through, people get permission to say the things they really feel. Notice in Act 6, they were groaning they were moaning. Now that's fascinating, because that word, groan, comes up in the previous time when God's people moaned about daily bread. It's the same word in the Septuagint Greek in the New Testament as it is in the Old Testament. It's the same word for moaning about the daily manna. Last time, it was a serious sin. But you see, the leaders are so if I can put it, wise in their kingly leadership, 
that even though it looks like the same sin, it is not. Most of us would have had Acts chapter 5, church discipline, and then Acts chapter 6, moaning about daily bread. We would have got our Bibles open and we'd have said, look, the Bible shows you that you are sinning against God, Greek-speaking widow and her family. We would have been wrong. But thankfully, the apostles had enough wisdom by God's grace to say, look, it looks like the same problem, but it is not. And as people express growing pain, it's like a 13-year-old coming up to go, Mum, my feet are hurting. Well, what's the problem? Well, my shoes are size 9. Well, what's the problem? But my feet are size 13. That's the problem. It's growing out of its capability. It wasn't like a two-year-old on a temper tantrum who doesn't want to put his wellies on when your 13-year-old says his feet are too small for his shoes. You've got to do something about it. It's not the same kind of thing. So the moaning about food in Exodus Numbers is not the same as the moaning about food in Acts 6. And as people expressed their concerns, the apostles were alerted to a problem that was going under the radar. And sometimes giving people permission to say, how does it feel now, and only want positives, doesn't help us as leaders. Sometimes hearing, like, as you go from 30 to 60, won't be too bad. If you go from 60 to 360, be terrible. It, that change is mainly negative. If you know it's coming, you can prepare people for it. Now, the second thing I want to talk about in terms of emotional intelligence, not just personally. Tom Fenning's been doing a, a great seminar, because I've heard him do it before. It's a fantastic seminar. You all, well, not all of you ought to go, but you know what I mean. Emotional intelligence in leaders, but you also need organizational intelligence, not just personal emotional intelligence. You need organizational nows. And ha- doing that small, medium, awkward, large exercise is just a way of understanding where you're at. But here's another one. If you've... Uh, You'd have been around me for any amount of time. You'd see uh, curves like this all over the place. Um, you can think of what stage are you in, in the life of a living organism, your organization, your church. And one author talks here about early struggle. And if you've done any church plant, you go, I know what that means, early struggle. But as it grows, you get to hear he talks about fun. You get over that initial, and then you begin to see growth. Now, you might not call it fun, but compared to what's coming, it's fun. (laughs) He then talks here, he talks about white water. Now, that's Acts chapter 6. The church has come through and it's growing, but then it gets into some kind of, there's not enough processes, there's not enough structures, we've not got... We haven't got any deacons. We haven't got any servants. What are we going to do? It's all white water. Now, the other side of the curve, he talks about treadmill, where everything is processes, and everything is like, oh, no, we've never done it that way before. Then he talks about deep rut down here. And, of course, if the rut gets too deep, you're six foot under, and rightly so, he talks about death. Now, up here, this bit here, he uses the phrase I'm not going to use, but I'm going to use the phrase healthy organization. Healthy organization. A healthy organization is a balance of organic and organized. If you don't have some organization, you're constantly in white water. You're always wanting to go back to fun when it was all just relational. And we, Let's have a church picnic today. Yeah, great. Whereas in a larger church... The diary, right, next June, we're going to have a picnic. Get it in the diary, see? You you always wanted to go back to fun. When we were smaller and it was relational, it was intimate, that sort of stuff. But if you go over-organised, you get into what's called treadmill. It's all driven, and it's all, oh, my name's on a rotor again. And it, it becomes a machine. And what the author argues very wisely for is... A healthy organization is the tension between white water and treadmill. And if you're into treadmill, you need to come back a little bit this way. And if you're in white water, you need to go a bit that way. Now, ask yourself, where are you as a church? Where are you as a family? Where are you as an organizer? Where are you at work? Are you in early struggle, fun, white water, healthy, treadmill, deep rut, or death? Now, all that's doing is an idea to help you understand where you are. It's just a a picture. It's not, this is the last word on these things. 
It's just enabling you to go, ah, right. So Acts chapter 6, without some of understanding, they could have got that seriously wrong. And they came up with a wonderfully brilliant leadership solution. Okay, third thing we're going to look at, as you go forward from keeping this tension, understanding where you are, develop wise structures. Develop some wise structures. So I just want to mention three. Uh, Jethro is one of my great heroes. Uh, Jethro chapter 18, Exodus. Jethro sees chaos. Moses is living in it. He hasn't got a clue what to do it. Moses is a humble genius of a man, isn't he? He's been steeped in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. He has learnt to be a man after God's own heart. But there's a problem presenting and he doesn't know what to do. But this outsider, this priest of Midian, whoever knows what that means, but he comes in as a non-covenant member. He sees the problem. He's a God-fearer because he says, if God blesses this, but my suggestion is that you organise this big chaotic mess into groups of 10, 50, 100, and 1,000. He comes up with a kingly leadership organisational solution based around a group of 10. Now, here's the thing. If you ever want to grow large, you have to grow small. If you're, if you're pastoring a church, you tend to think, well, if we have more pastors, we can look after a growing crowd. Can I tell you the reality? I, I remember once a dear friend of ours she, uh, lost her mother, and I went to see her. Uh, my wife and I probably went to see her three times in a month. Uh, not, and I don't mean just 10 minutes. I mean an hour or so at a time because she was very close to her mother. And at one of the meetings, she said, why hasn't, and then she named another new full-time worker, why hasn't X been round as well? And I thought, I thought if we have two workers, we basically divide the congregation up between us. Our members were thinking, now we've got two workers, we get double the number of visits. <laughs> and I realised that this is a receding target. This is never going to work. We have had to change. Our pastoral mindset is not, you get looked after by us, is that we have to look after each other. And so let's get in groups of 10. Now, in the Old Testament, that was quite rigorous. In the New Testament, Paul, when he says, I went from house to house, do not necessarily think, you know, I went to number two, then a number seven, and then number 12 of the row. More households. Remember how Lydia and her household, Philippian jailer and his household, they're, they're sort of small groups of people, basically. And a large, if it wants to care for people properly, well, Jethro's wisdom is not put them in a group of 100 and hope you do your best. Get them in groups of 10. Now, a, a group of 10 cannot support a full-time worker, very rarely. But there'll be somebody in the group who can lead, and the group itself will do its best to help. And if there's a problem that we can't deal with, we pass it up. So that Moses only got the most difficult issues. That's the wisdom of Jethro in Exodus 18. And if you're leading a growing church, sooner or later you will have to think very, very hard. How do we create a really strong, vibrant, well-supported, small group structure where people feel that they can share and pray and weep and rejoice with one another? On a level where they have enough eye-to-eye -eye contact with people to know that they, are, they belong here. That's the first thing. You grow larger by growing smaller. You need to work hard at small group support. The second thing is Acts 6 shows us if you want jobs done as a church gets bigger, you need a team approach. A team approach. Many, many churches, well, we have rotors, but that's not, rotors are not teams. How do teams work? You need to come to the next seminar. But seriously, it's worth doing a lot of hard work because actually, as a church gets bigger, well-functioning teams, so that you can say, we will hand this responsibility over to you so that we can be freed up to do things that only we can do. You do things that you only can do for us and with us so that we can be freed up. If we don't get some kind of team structure working like that, then our church will become a very overheated core, which will eventually lose heart and the thing will just disintegrate into people squabbling with each other, how frustrating church life is. Getting people into teams and getting them serving alongside their brothers and sisters is enormously important. 
In, in fact, uh, Larry Osborne wrote a very helpful book, Sticky Church, where he talks about the importance the large attracts the small Velcros. The final thing I want to talk about is this. Acts 15 is an example of H Q T D B M. Yeah, I didn't know what that meant either. <laughs> High quality, team-based decision making. As a church grows, when it's young, startup, most of the decisions are made by the core. They make fast decisions, implement them fast, mainly driven by the enthusiasm and the expertise of a founding pastor. But as it grows, that whole way of making decisions has to change. Even the members meeting, when there was 20 of us, it was easy to sense what's the consensus in the room. But when you've got 300 members, how do you know? I haven't got a clue, don't know. How do you make good decisions? And, and, the, and the wisdom is this, we need to develop all the way through. You see in Acts 15, it's a phenomenal example. The apostles and elders come together and at a high level... They get the Bible out, they discuss it together, they work it through, they think of different points of view. They come to a high-quality team-based decision-making. And we need to learn to do that. Most of us have had no training whatsoever. So we need to get some help. How do I run a great meeting? How do I make sure the ideas in the meeting actually happen? These are the things some of us need to work at. And that isn't just top leader level, that's all the way through the church. We need teams making high quality, team-based decision making. Many, many church members feel, do you know what, I'm at the bottom of the pile and the order comes down from on high and it gets dumped on me. Now you cannot sustain enthusiasm if that happens over the next 40 or 50 years of church life. We need to get ownership, we need to get involved, we need to get people in serving in a way that they, that they have a say and they own what's happening, that God is in this, so that these decisions are what we, under the Spirit of God's grace, go forward as a whole church. Just some ideas, three ideas. Now, here's the thing. We can talk ideas all day long. So what are you going to do about it? And what I'd like you to do right now is what we encourage our meetings to do, an action point that you're going to own. And I want you to verbalize that to somebody next to you. Say, on the basis of what I've just said, I am going to go and think about organic and organized. I'm going to go away and think about running a short talk at church about small, medium, awkward life. I am going to research HQTDBM. Talk to somebody next to you. This is my action point. No action point, nothing happens, just another talk. So talk to somebody next to you. Ten seconds, what is your action point? from this talk. Thank you.